Everyone has their favorite car generation. Mine is the 80s and 90s, but I'm not here to observe a museum piece. I put cars in their element. I'm Ryan Semancic, and this is Rad Ventures. The word is utilitarian. Machines designed for work over beauty. In this case, British machines. British tank is about as utilitarian as it gets. But since this is a car show, there's another British workhorse we need to talk about. But how rugged is it? Because this tank will plow through just about anything. Well, that appears to be a Range Rover. For the remainder of the video, I'm going to take you on a Land Rover adventure with their two most popular models from the mid-90s, the Range Rover Classic and the Defender 110. It's a bit of a story as to how I end up in the Defender, so you'll have to wait for that. But for now, I'm leaving this tank here and jumping in the Range Rover. Historically, Land Rovers were designed for the military, but really, that was more the Series 1 and 2 and the Defender. The Range Rover basically took the word utilitarian and threw it out the window. At that time, Land Rover realized they could only expand so far making uncomfortable work tractors. So they got smart and met a new market. Is it too good to be true? I, want this I have never fallen in love more for the design of a vehicle than I have for the Range Rover Classic. And the rest of the world did too, because during the first year of its production, the Range Rover became the first ever vehicle displayed in the Louvre as an exemplary work of industrial design. The Range Rover became the coolest and most stylish member of the Land Rover family. This is the first generation Range Rover, and it stayed pretty much the same from 1970 onward, all the way up here until 1995, which this model is, now you might be thinking, okay, yeah, Range Rover, it's cool, but it's not Defender cool, right? Like Defender cool was the camel trophy in the 80s and 90s, like plowing through the jungles and the deserts and people from all different countries competing to get that top prize of like the ultimate overlander. And that's what you saw, like that yellow Defender smashing through mud pits. Well, actually the Range Rover was the first Land Rover to be a part of the Camel Trophy. And it was part of the Camel Trophy for three years, 1981, 1982, and 1987. And yeah, it was replaced with the Defender and then the Discovery, but the Range Rover was the original Camel Trophy truck. It was designed for performance and for luxury and for comfort, but they never let go of that off-road prowess. This was given to me to borrow by Jared at Churchill Classics. Now Jared has done this up. It's got the 3.9 liter V8 and that's stock, but he had it rebuilt about 3,000 miles ago. It's got the ZF automatic four-speed gearbox. It's got a Borg Warner transfer case, a roof rack for extra explorability. So these are pretty nice. BFG KO2s, which is a pretty common off-road tire. Super grippy and they don't like wear out. They're pretty solid tire. They've got nice side tread. He has Old Man Emu springs on here and Bilstein dampers, which is the good stuff. Old Man Emu is an Australian spring and suspension company, pretty common in overlanding vehicles. It brings it up about one and a half inches. So one and a half inches from stock, fitting a little bit bigger tire, 
but other than that, it's not overly done. It's the right amount of lift and the right amount of tire for the motor and the gearing. I mean, it's super basic, but super set up. It's kind of a sleeper off-roader, and that's what you want. You know, this isn't your mall crawler. This is your stylish, capable British off-roader. So it doesn't take much to make these your overlanding show queens. But that wasn't exactly what Land Rover was going for when they started this project. So the key thing about a Range Rover is it was actually designed for the American market. At the time, Land Rover weren't bringing cars over to America because of EPA and safety regulations, and they just abandoned the market altogether until they realized that the Bronco and the Jeep Wagoneer were selling like hotcakes over in North America. They found a V8, they made a bigger body, and they took what they had actually developed in the 50s, which was their Road Rover, which is the road-going version of their series Land Rovers, revamped it, made the Range Rover, and that's what started this luxury SUV market in North America. Now, the Wagoneer and Bronco very much had luxury elements, but once Range Rover caught up to their rivals in interior comfort, they kind of ran away with it. Now, obviously with the Range Rover, it's a little bit more civilized than its Defender cousin. Now, the lines are better, the plastic dash is nicer, you have more heating controls. You have an analog clock, high-low, wood grain, as well as the shifter. All of the power heated seats and windows and everything are right there. It's great. The only weird thing is, is I have the seat all the way down and my head, it still hits the roof line. Like, I feel massive as a human being in this massive vehicle, which shouldn't happen. I should feel small. Let's go take this thing to where it should be going. Some real off-roading. Some camel trophy stuff. All right, this is more like it. Now we're doing Range Rover things. We're about to cross a river. That approach angle is steep. <laughs> a couple rocks, no big deal. It's rugged. The ice is breaking. Don't hit that stump. Oh, we're sliding in, we're sliding in. Okay. Oh. That's ice. This is deep. This is very, very deep. That's all ice, all ice. Oh my God, this truck is unbelievable. Soundproof carpeting, we were just up to the doors. There's a leather seat that's heated and I just got through all that. Jared just did it right with this thing because it's got the right tires, it's got the right springs, it's got the right amount of lift. It's not ridiculous. We're not running on super swampers that are blown out and have no grip. Oh no! These trails are gnarly. You wouldn't think modern Range Rovers would be at home at stuff like this, and they're not. But 80s, 90s Range Rovers? They'll do it all day long. Ease it in, ease it in. Don't scrape the side. I mean, the thing about real off-roading is if it's gnarly enough, which this trail is, if you're just hammering through stuff because it looks cool, you're not really off-roading properly. You're just showing off and breaking stuff. And you know what happens when you break? You don't go anywhere. Little rock there. Oh, there's a little one. Put the, put your tire right on it. Come on down, take the back. There we go. Just like that. Homeward bound. <laughs> We're gonna make it. Just one more spot to get through, but I don't think it's that tricky. This is so deep. Oh my gosh. No, 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 we're not stuck, we're not stuck. 
Oh, Well, it's up to the frame, pretty much in the back at least. And now unfortunately, this model didn't come with lockers, which is hung up in there as well. well. Let's see if I can figure it out. Not a good place to be stuck. Come on. You hear that clicking? So it actually has traction control. Oh. Ah. Light's fading, it's not getting out. This is just, you know, BFGs are good tires, but when they're caked in mud, they're just slicks. It doesn't look too bad, but I step in it and like, look at my foot. Holy, oh. it's quick mud. I don't know what to do but try to like walk out of here. I'm coming back for you, Range Rover. We're gonna get you out. Sometimes the best four wheel drives can't outpace our two feet. So I had to walk on to where I knew the Defender was stashed, but the weather was starting to turn. So I had to find it fast. So I made it on top of this ridge, I think about a thousand feet higher than where I was before. It's starting to snow. At this point, I was freezing, and the snow really prevented me from recognizing landmarks. So it took a few hours, but eventually, I made it to the Defender's location. There was a problem, though. It hadn't been run in a very long time. Oh, it's a little dirty in here. Got oil. That wire's not hooked up. Let's see if that works. Well, do we have power? We got lights. I guess this is gonna be an expedition. Time to defend. Well, to get back to the Range Rover, we gotta go up the mountain before we can go down. So, get over this little snow squall, a couple big hills. I can't believe we just made it up that hill. Wow. <laughs> that is so steep. To this day, I don't think there is any vehicle more synonymous to adventure than a 110 Defender. And it'll go anywhere, do anything, and that's exactly how Land Rover marketed it. It's not really the simplicity and the capability nowadays that attracts people to the Defender. What I really think it is, is the styling. Defenders are like the cruising icon. Take them to cars and coffee, impress your friends that you're outdoorsy and you actually canoe or something. But we're not doing any of that. We're just plowing through the woods because that's what a Defender should be doing. All right, this is by far the biggest hill I've ever gone down. We're like facing the ground. Oh. I did some research after finding this thing in the trees and it says Himalaya on the door. It turns out Himalaya is a Land Rover restoration and spruce company for luxury buyers. They put like V8s and do all sorts of stuff, really nice interiors. They do unbelievable work. 
but it looks like this one is actually pretty stock. It's got a paint job. It's got a little bit bigger wheels and tires. It's got a nice worn wench, snorkel, stock springs, stock axles, and a roof rack. But other than that, it's got me through all this stuff so far, so I think it's pretty good. But I've always paid attention to these Defenders. We didn't really get them in the US, and that's because, well, a lot of it was safety and EPA regulation. Because, like, look at these pillars. I mean, they're so narrow, and the door is so close to your leg. Like, if you got T-boned in this thing, you're not making it. Now, most of this is because this truck is heavily based off the Series 1, which started development in 1948. The Defender very much carries the original Land Rover ideology of function over form. And that's what makes this thing so special. It's like aircraft design. It's hard to change something that just works. So whether you're driving a Series 1 or 2 Land Rover or a mid-90s Defender, you can't help but be catapulted back to that simpler time where the truck was designed to last, but you were held in with a lap belt. It just makes me smile because everything about driving Defenders is so visceral. You can feel the rocks, and the mud leaks through the door seals. It's all just massively fun. So props to Land Rover for keeping this thing as close to its original Jeep competitor as it ever could be. With this Defender, it's back to Land Rover's roots. Inline four-cylinder diesel motors. This motor is a 300 TDI a 2.5 liter turbo diesel producing 111 horsepower and 195 pound-feet of torque. And the turbo is so tiny. It's this big. It's so little tiny turbo. Now the chassis in these Defenders is a steel ladder design and the panels are made of aluminum. So Defenders were most commonly sold in the 90 and the 110. And 90 and 110 is the wheelbase in inches. This one is 110. And with the 110, you got the four door, and that makes it super useful and a lot longer. Here's where things get a little bit different than the Range Rover. Basic seats, plastic dash, small little gauge cluster, still has the analog clock, but no RPM gauge. This one's a five-speed manual. Transfer case is just high-low. It's always four-wheel drive. The armrest is like sheet metal. Everything else, it's all about function and simplicity. It's interesting enough though, I'm realizing as I'm making my way back to the Range Rover that the Range Rover's axles and its overall ground clearance are actually better than this Defender. I'm definitely riding a little bit more in these wagon tracks in this thing than I was in the Range Rover. So I've had my fun banging the Defender around and I really like it. But at this point, I had to navigate back to that Range Rover and finish my expedition. We go that way, we're gonna go right. Oh my gosh, oh, right in the water. I'll just go nice and slow, try not to get water in the engine. Seems like it doesn't hurt to go a little faster. Oh my god, over the hood. <laughs> oh my god, this is so tight. Stay there, rock. Good rock. Underneath this little canopy. Looks like to the right over there. Up the waterfall, I think it'll get me out of here. Oh, yes, and we're free. Oh man, I mean at this point, I don't know where this thing is. I'm trying to get through this stuff. Oh, hey, there it is. I'm a Range Rover.
kind of a hard choice. This thing's like super nice, really classy, kind of stylish. This thing's like rugged, dependable, diesel. There's no question that I feel the Range Rover is the more beautiful of the two. The styling is just unsurpassed and timeless. But I'm not so sure I'm a fan of the V8 automatic. See, if I want to buy a Land Rover, I don't want something that drives like a Bronco. The Defender's low-geared manual transmission and the Torque 300 TDI really make it feel like a little European workhorse. And for styling, sure, it's no Range Rover, but the Defender looks cool in its own way. There's something to be said about Land Rover selling basically the same design for 68 years. When it works, it just works. And when it comes down to it, when I'm faced with the decision to choose between two Land Rovers, I'm always going to choose function over beauty. It's already getting dark. I don't like doing this, but if found, get it unstuck and it's yours. Yeah, I don't think this is coming out of here anytime soon, but bye buddy. One of the best trucks I've ever driven. Sometimes in the hardest of expeditions, you have to abandon the weaker link, even if you don't want to. Bye, Range Rover. Hope you find a new home. Hey, Jared, it's Ryan. It's about 6.30. Hey, listen, I left your Range Rover in the woods, stuck in the mud, somewhere in New York. Give me a call back. I'll give you the coordinates.